problem. Yes, being recorded. Thank you so much. Um, so I, I think it's out of uh, a common practice at GIG that we record uh, our community calls so that members that are not able to attend for one reason or another can see it later and also to try to accommodate for the different crazy different time zones that we have within uh, our network. So thank you everyone for being here today and a special thanks to our speakers also coming from very different parts in the world. and. Uh, crazy time zones. So I, I thank you very much for making the time and taking uh, time to present your amazing work. Uh, I'm Fadi Al Gharib. I'm the community lead at the Global Innovation Gathering Network. And uh, it is from the name, it's a global network of uh, amazing people, innovators, change makers, maker spaces, all kinds of spaces that share uh, common values for openness, for changing the world, for uh, sharing openly solutions, whether it's uh, software, hardware, uh, all kinds of solutions, sharing it uh, within the community um, in aims to democracy knowledge and see our communities changing to the better and building a better future. We believe that the future starts with the local community itself. It starts bottom up. Uh, it starts with people having the tools to speak up for their needs and then getting the tools to build the solutions uh, and find the solutions for these needs. And this can only be more possible with the technologies present um, in today's world and with uh, the great opportunity that the internet provides for us. Um, so yeah, moving towards democratizing knowledge in a way or another. Um, today's topic is uh, something in the core of everything that I'm talking about because it really uh, addresses a pressing need, which is climate change. Uh, and this is something that now more than ever we can witness and see all around us happening, making it a truly global pressing problem, let's say. Uh, I'm very, very happy that a lot of our speakers, uh, our member speakers, uh, responded to my invitation for them to present the amazing work they're doing in so many different parts of the world and presenting a new perspective into how could we collectively combat uh, the effects and navigate the, the, the negative impact of the climate change uh, in our communities uh, by presenting different models, right? So I'm, I'm very happy to be on this panel today or on the board organizing this call today and hope that uh, we could together explore different uh, possibilities for fundraising for such projects so that we could actually uh, be able to do the work we want to do and, and uh, strive to do to change our communities for the better. So thank you very much. And from here, I give it back to you, David. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Fadia. So let me give you, Sarah, an opportunity to discuss about yourself and your organization and then, yeah. Of course, thanks, David. It's great to be here. Um, my name is Sarah. I am the Director of Resource Mobilization at Climate 2025. Um, we are um, about a three-year-old um, startup um, that works to provide infrastructure and um, capacity building support for emerging movements um, and grassroots organization that are working across different intersections of, of climate um, with a focused lens on, on climate justice. Um, so what we do um, in one way is to help um, de-risk, so to speak, um, uh, certain groups to enable access to funding um, from funders who are looking for um, certain types of eligibility cr criteria to be met and also to be able to relieve some of those back end administrative work around managing finance so that folks can, can really focus on the work that they're doing. Um, and then alongside that, um, we also provide spaces for capacity building through um, um, more customized boot camps for groupings of movements to kind of go through learning journeys together um, and have found through this work that actually um, it's kind of changed our perception of what training and capacity building really means. A lot of the the, the wisdom is actually generated from the, the folks in the room. It's not really about this unidirectional passing along of wisdom. It's about creating more spaces for connection and to be able to exchange ideas. Um, 
and I was brought in um, to this space to support movements and activists around funding and fundraising. Um, and that in and of itself has been a, a pretty evolutionary journey um, because I was um, uh, trained sort of in the conventional ways of philanthropy and fundraising and in an institutional setting. And then coming to this um, space and really being able to understand all the fluid ways of working and all the ways in which um, philanthropy um, is, is not working and really, really reinforcing a lot of really detrimental power dynamics. So what I uh, have been doing is kind of helping to straddle that line of pushing to transform how funding can work um, by um, testing some different pooled mechanisms for, for funding and working alongside funders to kind of learn about um, kind of stretching the limits of, of their comfort zones to, to get more funding to the movement space and to really understand and learn together. Um, and as and then also kind of working within the practical boundaries that are occurring, you know, within the next month or so, how do you get the funding you need to get access to now in a year? And so half the things that I do, um, you know, support around and say, I don't necessarily condone. It's not something that I find equitable and sometimes find it to be very extractive and it detracts from the work that people are doing. So it is a really um, fine line to walk, but um, really interesting and insightful space to, to have been working. And so really excited for this conversation. Thank you so much for, for the introduction, Sarah. So let me go ahead and pass it to you, Cold Deep. Give us, you know, a little bit of background about the organization you're working on, but expand about the specific project that is uh, community-led and innovative in terms of trying to address uh, climate change. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Cold Deep. Um, I'm, I work at uh, Field Ready as the innovation lead for the Bangladesh team. Um, I've been working in the sector for about eight years now, various different capacity, mostly focusing on humanitarian response and innovation in the humanitarian response. Um, would it be okay if I share my screen just to give a quick uh, presentation or uh, would you want to just? Uh... I think if you could just discuss about it, would it be nice any presentation material that we have, we'll share it as a, a resource at, uh, at the end. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, one of the things that Field Ready really focuses on is localization. And most of the time in the humanitarian responses, uh, localization is only looked in into from the capacity building perspective. But the thing that we really focus on at, at Field Ready is localization of the supply chain. Um, you know, majority of the humanitarian aid supplies are imported from all across the, you know, manufacturing global hubs like China and, and India and then transported into these countries for humanitarian responses where you know they come through massive long supply chain system that have really big carbon footprint and while that is also happening and the even though the you know refugees or the, the people who are um, kind of uh, suffering from disasters get benefited out of the um, humanitarian aid item on the other side of the supply chain we are reduced we, there's a huge opportunity cost on economic surplus if if the product is made locally um, and we improvise, uh, we focus on localization of the supply chain where the humanitarian, where the, let's say the community in the country that is either hosting the refugees or, you know, uh, is around the, uh, you know, communities that are suffering from disaster, if they're able to be kind of build, a, if we're able to build a capacity and then kind of support them in making humanitarian aid items, um, then we will enable a huge economic uh, social surplus uh, opportunity costs that we're currently losing. You know, uh, what that also allows is kind of co social cohesion to function between the local host as well as the refugee community, which typically is always in a challenging situation. Um, and kind of building that local supply chain, uh, we are, uh, that is what we really focuses on. And, you know, uh, local manufacturing in, in this case, uh, as into our topic, local manufacturing needs local supply of materials, right? Plastic is an important supply of material. And this is why we're invested um, in supporting innovation in local plastic recycling. We feel that there is uh, there is opportunity that we can, uh, through innovation, that we can bring in local innovators and local solution providers to kind of 
come together, work on different sort of plastic recycling technologies and create a local ecosystem where the waste can be turned into raw materials for producing humanitarian aid items. Now, one of the prominent thing that we've been working on over the past two years has been a multi-phased intervention on understanding the use of local plastic recycling materials and this innovation in designing some of these as humanitarian aid items in the Rohingya refugee camp in Cox's Bazar in Bangladesh. Uh, and as part of that, this is, we've been partnering with the Norwegian Refugee Council, um, Feel Ready in Bangladesh and Norwegian Refugee Council in Bangladesh. And we've currently gone through two phases of um, innovation processes where at the first phase, we looked at what we can recycle, uh, what can we, what kind of different humanitarian aid products that we can make um, out of recycled plastic and uh, and in the in the first phase, we honed into looking at how we can kind of use recycled materials as shelter items. Um, nowadays, you know, uh, we mostly typically in the humanitarian response, we look at shelter as a form of just, you know, a house to live in. But what we thought of was what if we could use the waste that is generated in the camps? I'll give you a small example. You know, uh, World Food Program gives two bottles of plastic bottles of oil. Um, in the refugee camp for each household. And there are about 250,000 households. That amounts to about 500,000 plastic bottles indirectly in injected into the camps, in the refugee camps every month. That's 4.8 million plastic bottles inside the camp just on oil, right? Oil plastic bottles. Now that's huge amount of plastic waste. And what we're doing right now is we've built these, uh, you know, solution, you know, products like roof tiles, floor tiles, bricks, uh, plastic sheets using different sort of local you know, you know innovations and local machineries local manufacturing capacity here in Bangladesh uh, to build these products uh, that and and in the phase one in phase two we uh, in we made a couple of small shelters as part of uh, that that kind of uses a mix of bamboo plus metal plus and a roof tile and a, a floor tiles that are made out of recycled plastics um, uh, and and this has the potential to have a transform transformative effect in the uh, in in the camps not just from the perspective of you know of course from the perspective that we are kind of utilizing waste into shelter items um, but also from a livability perspective you know now uh, there, there there isn't a single bed inside the refugee camp right and 1.5 million people there is no bed right people always live in floors and you know for elderly you know the it's it's a huge is issue for their um, you know, elderly for the pregnant mother, mothers is the huge issue for their knees and the joints. And if you're able to install these solar, you know, floor tiles that are made out of plastic layer and create an insulating layer, what from the ground, what it does is it, it reduces, it kind of traps heat, meaning that cool place becomes cold and then, how, you know, hot, hot air is not allowed inside, right? Uh, meaning the hot, uh, hot, you know, when it when it's hot, it's cool. And when it's cool, it's hot, right? So sort of like insulating layers, um, so what we are doing is uh, we're looking at building local supply chains. We've now focused, we've now understood what it takes for us to like scale this solution. It's been two years of research work, lab tests on whether our product is good or not. And, and also looking at how we can not just look at it from a pure technical perspective, but build and, and instead of change the plastic recycling into more of a plastic value chain. You know, where at, at every point of the recycling system, we increase the, the value of the plastic product so that we're not just selling the final product, but, you know, we are engaging the local refugee community with the local host community to be part of, you know, further processes more than just collection, but, you know, processing, shredding, you know, cleaning the plastic, you know, kind of bringing them uh, into the process of production. You know, there is a huge um, uh, garment industry, uh, you know, in Bangladesh, and which has a lot of potential for, you know, real manufacturing work. And because Field Ready is across multiple different countries, we've worked on plastic recycling in Syria, in Nepal, um, in, you know, not in the Pacific region, um, and in Bangladesh, of course, uh, we've been able to, you know, capture all of our failures, because we've had a lot of failures in between over the past many years. And we've come into a stable position of Kind of mainstreaming plastic recycling and we're in a situation where we can you know build now markets build systems and build so you know scale these solutions that we have experimented for over the past four or five years across multiple countries at feel ready and i feel like from especially from a perspective of feel ready bangladesh uh, we are we're kind of ready to take this forward you know look at looking at like not just 
focusing on you know managing plastic waste in the community you know the refugee camps is just beside the indian ocean right the bay of bengal uh, kind of protecting the plastic waste to enter in, enter into the river in rivers and the oceans but also utilize that waste and turn into value for uh, refugees in the in the shelter in the in the refugee camp so that the the plastic waste truly becomes you know valuable items uh, for people who are who really need these products on the ground that's pretty impressive and, and I'm so happy you're able to basically what you guys are trying to do is address the entire ecosystem from yeah. the beginning to end and that's pretty innovative and there's quite a, a few questions I'll ask you and let me give your, your, your other colleagues an opportunity to speak. So Pamela, if, if you can unmute yourself and give us a, a bit of a background about yourself, your organization and the specific innovation project that, that, that you're working on. Amazing. Hi, everybody. Happy to be here today. My name is Pamela Silva Diaz, and I'm the owner at Pamela Design and Engineering. I'm based in Puerto Rico, which is an archipelago in the Caribbean. And I work with different organizations, community based organizations, um, nonprofits, and social enterprise. And we work to address climate change issues that um, affect our local communities in Puerto Rico and in other regions of Latin America. And we do that specifically by um, developing low cost and affordable technologies and solutions that can be used to address some of these challenges. So I lead participatory design processes um, with community groups and with other stakeholders in order to design um, these uh, low cost and affordable innovations that can be led by the communities. And so today I wanted to speak to you about one of the projects that we have, which is um, really interesting. It's about um, mitigating the problems with sargassum seaweed in the Caribbean. So right now, uh, sargassum seaweed, that's a brown algae that floats in the ocean. And in the recent years, there has been a lot of um, high quantities of biomass of this sargassum algae floating in the ocean and then just coming to the shore of the beaches of the different islands in the Caribbean. And it's actually a very serious problem. Um, you can have miles and miles of beaches just filled with this seaweed. And this seaweed decomposes and it produces a, a very bad smell that really affects the residents of the coastal communities and also the tourism industry, the, the hotels and also um, the, the tourist uh, sports activities that are done in the beach and also the restaurants that are by the beach. It's um, a very difficult to, to conduct your daily life with all of this decomposing seaweed that is, you know, smelling very, very strongly and also just filling the beach. So it's very difficult to, to actually do anything in the beach, any activity with so much floating seaweed. Um, also, uh, the people who dedicate themselves to fishing, they also suffer a lot from the seaweed because it gets tangled in their nets. Um, it gets tangled in their boats, in their motors, their engines, and that can actually become very dangerous because um, their engines can break down because of all of the seaweed that gets stuck in it. So there's a, a really big problem. And many of these coastal communities uh, are actually uh, communities where there's a lot of um, low income families that dedicate themselves to fishing that uh, that go through this. So um, I'm working with a team of collaborators. Two of us are working in Puerto Rico, uh, are based in Puerto Rico. Two of, uh, of us are based in Colombia, and then one person is based in Australia. And we're working together to understand um, what is the impact of this seaweed in Puerto Rico, but also in the island of Providencia, which is part of Colombia. So we are working in two islands of the Caribbean. And we have been first um, interviewing different stakeholders to understand the impact of the seaweed, but also understanding what is the interest of community members with the seaweed, because with the sargassum algae, you can actually create different products. For example, you can make fertilizer. It can be it can be the raw material to make fertilizer. You could make um, textiles, you could make paper, you could make soap, ink, bioplastics. So there's actually many products that can be made out of the seaweed. So we are wondering what if the coastal community members um, are actually empowered to use the seaweed and they can actually use it as a raw material and then have an economic activity based on products made out of seaweed. 
So um, besides um, doing interviews and understanding what are people interested in creating, there was actually a lot of interest in fertilizer. That was the, the main interest for the community members. So we held educational workshops where we went, uh, we did step-by-step -step, um, activities where people learned how to turn seaweed into fertilizer, also into soap and ink and paper. So they were interactive workshops where the community members actually learned how to create this. And they were very interested in creating businesses out of this. And then the other part of our project is that um, the, the way to transform seaweed into a product, it's actually, uh, it, it, it can be a very tedious process because you need to wash, you need to collect the seaweed, you need to wash it, you need to dry it, you need to shred it sometimes. Times. And um, it can be very difficult if you're doing this by hand. And there's some uh, industrial machinery, but it's a more of an industrial level. It's not accessible to the community members. So we did co-creation workshops to see what ideas people have to use local materials to create machines that can be used to transform the seaweed more easily into these products. And then we did the same also with the fishing community, because since they have a lot of problems with the seaweed in their boats, then they wanted to create barriers, floating barriers that prevent the seaweed from getting into the shore and to the beach. So we actually did these workshops and we created in Providencia, we created a prototype with the community members of a floating barrier that is made with materials that are locally available in the island. And then in the east coast of Puerto Rico, we're also working with fishermen to do the same thing to create this locally sourced floating barrier. So that's um, in a snapshot, you know, this this project and basically our mission is that um, the coastal the members of coastal communities can um, take leadership and agency and really take this problem and turn it into this opportunity but that can really be led by them and they can really benefit from this resource thank you now thank you so much for for, for that explanation and the important work you're doing i have a, a few questions that i want to ask but like i said i'll save it to um the next one and let me give uh Pyro from Blue Greece, an opportunity to, to speak about the, the specific project you're working on, as well as if you add on a bit of yourself, as well as the organization. And then we'll come to you, Matthew. Okay? Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm a mechanical engineer and I represent Blue Greece. We're an open source hardware development collective, which means that we develop hardware solutions that remain publicly available. So people can actually build them replicate them, modify them, or even sell them because the design is for free and provided other a free license. Our core project at the moment is called uh, Libre Water. So it's this idea of creating one small desalination device. So the issue that we tackle has to do with the water scarcity and providing clean drinking water. And we try to build this in a way that people can actually replicate it by themselves in maker spaces in the global south. And this is where Geek has played an important role in connecting us with maker spaces there. So we can actually co-design the solution and make sure that it can be built and manufactured locally. Uh, so this is what we've been trying to do for the past two years. Now we're working on the solar part of this device. So after having testing it in the lab, now we try to make sure that it can just run on solar energy. So it doesn't need any electricity, just solar thermal. And then hoping that next year we're able to deploy it in the field and make sure that a lot of people in rural communities have access to clean drinking water through this device. So this is mostly what we're up to now. No, thank you so much. And like I said, I have a lot of questions for you as well. And give an opportunity to, to, to your colleague Matthew if you can go ahead and introduce yourself and give us a little bit about you know your organization and specific you know climate related innovation that your organization working on would be appreciated uh, thank you so much uh, first place I'm so grateful uh, to be here on this platform I'm Matthew Rubari and um, I'm the director for community creativity for development uh, Refugee founded and led organization in Uganda, uh, which was formed in 2019. Um, how the organization came into existence, uh, we identify a gap in uh, repair of uh, items 
uh, when we arrived in the camp, that was in 2016. Uh, most challenge that we faced was like, most organizations, especially the humanitarian organizations were more focusing on um, a life-saving kind of activities, for example, uh, construction of shelters, uh, health-related programs, education, but uh, neglecting you know, uh, repair of items that are in the hands of the, the refugees themselves. So after realizing that, uh, we quickly uh, came together as a group of three youths, uh, two gentlemen, I and one called Richard and uh, a lady called Edina, uh, who had been part of the uh, beneficiaries of the uh, AskNet project run by Rock Agency. And um, we currently also are members in the Geek Network. So uh, we quickly came together and formed the organization with the aim of uh, connecting communities while finding solutions that protects the environment from you know, global warming. And our focus has been more in solving issues related to climate change. So uh, we have been doing a number of activities uh, that are related to sustainable practice related to uh, e-waste management, uh, that is to say providing and repair services and trainings, uh, e-waste uh, collection of items that have reached end of life uh, from the hands of the refugees, uh, including doing innovative ways like upcycling and recycling of those uh, electronic waste that have reached end of life. Um, and at the moment, uh, our project that we have been doing, we've been doing repair cafe events where community members, the refugees, youths, they come together and learn how to repair electronic items. Uh, so we move from one location to another within the, uh, the, 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 the refugee settlement, but then the refugee settlement is quite a big, uh, area, it cost about um, oh, about 127,000 refugees from South Sudan, uh, Rwanda, Congo, including Central African Republic. And it's wide, you know, apart where one distance from a village, it has seven villages. So Rainakam has seven villages and uh, I mean seven zones, and each zone has villages and they are quite far apart from from each other. So refugees tend to move a very long distance to uh, to repair their their electronic items by then before uh, CC4D uh, came into existence. They could travel uh, a distance of over 60 kilometers, which is quite long and have you know a lot of risk, more especially for women and girls. Yeah, some you know felt victims of um, of rape or other kind of violence during their way to repair those electronics items. For example, most of the electronic items that are in the hands of the refugees uh, include the solar lamps, radios, mobile phones, uh, and other non-electronic items like bicycles that helps them to, to communicate, access information, and uh, for security at night, for example, lightning at night, but also to charge their mobile phone uh, devices. But uh, over the first years, um, during arrival, UNHCR as well, including other partners, helped the refugees, they distributed to them electronic items, uh, like what I have mentioned, uh, some through, uh, humanitarian support, some through instance types kind of uh, uh, giveaways and others, you know, being bought by the refugees themselves. But the challenge has been the disposal of these electronic items once they get, um, they get to their end of life. Like any other items, you know, it reaches to end of life. So most of those items has been discarded uh, 
or dispose of improperly through, uh, for example, uh, ways such as burnings, which is the most common one, uh, throwing in, in pit holes uh, uh, and throwing in gardens. Yeah. And improper disposal of such waste is so uh, dangerous to the climate and as well to uh, to human health in a way that uh, it has toxic chemicals that when enters into water bodies and people con uh, consume the water, it intends to you know what, renew someone's life. But also burning results into polluting the environment. Yeah. And as well, loss of fertility uh, of the soil due to uh, uh, non-degradable uh, bio, not, I mean, non degradable components. Yeah. For example, the batteries, they don't degrade easily, and other kind of plastic weights from these electronic items. And this increases the risk of chronic diseases such as cancers, as well, and as well, uh, impacts negatively on the soil fertility. Uh, for example, currently uh, in Rhino Farm, you find us that. Uh, Crops, you know, there's the too much sun heat has destroyed most of the crops, and the contribution of electronic waste is also uh, one of the big cause. Yeah. So, according to uh, a, a report um, being published in 2022 by the uh, United Nations uh, International Training uh, Association of Research, you know, uh, uh, it highlights that the amount, I mean, the number of waste management in in refugee settlements, you know, it's insufficient. For example, lack of data and lack, lack of data on the items that goes into the refugee camps and as well, the amount of waste that is being, uh, uh, being managed. And until now, it's only one partner that is currently uh, doing waste management uh, kind of activities, and it's only related to uh, solar uh, solar products, and that is IOM, which is implementing in a BDBD refugee settlement. But in Rhino Camrest refugee settlement, it has not been uh, happening. And, and uh, our idea, what what we did was to to do uh, the mobile repair cafe events that we move from one location to another to repair on spot, to do on spot repairs and as well training. And these uh, repair cafes, they are so good in a way that it promotes as well peace among the refugees themselves. Because when the refugees went to the camp, all they go with different kind of mindsets, some were being traumatized. Uh, but when they come together during the repair cafe events, you find that um, they get to live because the, the activity is kind of a unique activity that uh, it has a lot of fun in it. And more uniquely, the inclusion of women as uh, women technicians in those repair cafe events, something so unique that has not been you know, happening within uh, the refugee camp. And currently, uh, we hope so being uh, trying to, uh, to, to popularize or to create awareness in terms of promoting repair, the importance of repairing things uh, through uh, conducting events, uh, public events like the International Repair Day uh, event, which is of course uh, happening in, um, which happens every year uh, on the third, I mean, on the second week of, uh, October, uh, and it is being uh, uh, created or formed by the Open Alliance uh, Group in the Netherlands, a, an international body of repairers uh, that is aimed to to, to promote uh, the long lasting of electronic items, but as well promoting uh, repair parties. Yeah, so uh, that is uh, the current uh, project that we are trying to, uh, to to look at in order, and it's celebrated every year within uh, 
uh, mostly in the European countries, but when it comes to the African context, uh, it's not yet you know, known, but uh, we're also looking at promoting it uh, locally within uh, the refugee camps, but also bringing uh, to my home country that is South Sudan. Uh, so we are looking at doing two kind of events in Uganda and in South Sudan to promote the essence of repairing items uh, in order to cut down or reduce on the amount of electronic waste that are in the hands of the communities as well, prolonging the life of the electronic items that we have. Because there are so many amount of waste in the hands of uh, the communities. For example, uh, according to uh, the electrical and electronic uh, equipment ownership, uh, reports which was generated by uh, Uganda Bureau of Standards. It shows that uh, the electronic and electrical equipments that is being owned by people in Uganda, for example, mobile phones, it amounts up to 73%. Meanwhile, uh, 45% are radios and 17% are TV, television, and 3% being computers, yeah. And with uh, the growing amount or with the increasing amount, the developments in technology, we believe that by now the number has gone higher because uh, many telecom companies has emerged and this has risen the uh, number of people connecting to, uh, to the internet and accessing information through electronic means. So they still, that shows um, rise in uh, the number of devices that uh, in the hands of the people. But then if you compare the amount of uh, these items that are in the hands of the people or the amount of users, vice versa, the number of people who are doing repairs, the number of people doing repairs are so uh, low in a way that only a few people do repair for commercial purposes. And basically repair has been disregarded as uh, a skill for people who has not gone you know, for education, for their formal education, but rather for people who are uh, school dropouts or who are stuck in continuing with their uh, formal education. Yeah. So in uh, 2022, last year, uh, we were able to conduct uh, a public event. We started by first conducting a mini event uh, at our space. We have established a, a maker space called Bright Maker Space, and uh, we use it also as a repair cafe center where we we're promoting or doing repairs on every day from Monday to Fridays. Yeah, and then we managed to to hold a public event to where we brought together uh, partners who are operating within the refugee camps to, to share and showcase uh, how we do our repair things and how uh, young youths can repair items. Yeah. So I'm so grateful uh, to be here today and as well to present uh, to you what we have been doing. And otherwise, uh, because of time factor, I mm -hmm. I beg to stop here and look forward for okay. questions. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much, Matthew. That that was quite a uh, an important perspective that you have, as well as the innovative work that you're doing, and then highlighting that the electronic waste component of it even though it's bringing you know, positive things, positive development, but there's an, always an element that's neglected, which is the waste component once that, that product is, is, is no longer in use. So thank you so much, Matthew. So one of the unique things that we do with this webinar is we, we try to bring different stakeholders together. And that's why we have a funding element to it, as well as a network and the civil society um, um, uh, organizations that are actually on the ground doing the necessary work in this specific context to address the climate issue. So we try to, in our 
next segment is where I'm going to be able to ask um, each of you, you know, and being able to give us the different perspectives. So collaboratively, we'll be able to gain knowledge. And what we want to do is be able to have a, an understanding of it, one, in terms of being able to scale up the, these amazing projects that we're doing, get a better understanding of the funding landscape that, that, that as it stands and the importance of how networks can support as, as, as well as the, the, the funding group as well too. So we want to be able to explore the resource opportunities, understand the emerging trends and navigate especially the common challenges that, that, that we all face. So let me go ahead and pose my first question. And it's going to be um, to you, uh, Fadia. So one of the things I think that's important to, to understand is in the realm of climate adaptation that we need to identify key funding sources. So when we look at the statistics out there, it's one of the sectors that actually gets the least amount of funding when it comes down to it. And when you bring it to Global South organization, within that 1% that that's available, it goes down. So let me get you to, to ask this, you know, you guys get an opportunity to work with multiple organizations globally, you know, doing different things. So as a network, you do assist your, your um, the organizations that you work with in terms of being able to, to give them funding opportunities. So from your perspective, can you give us where you see See to be the challenges that that's section one and to where opportunities can come in terms of trying to, to resolve that. And after you answer that, I'll phrase the same question to Sarah so she can give us uh, the, from the funder perspective as well as to you guys as well to as an organization where you're succeeded, where you're having challenges. So I think we will be able to get a, a much more kind of an eagle's view of where the funding landscape is and how we can move together trying to, to address those issues. So, but yeah, let, let me uh, give this, the, the mic to you. Thank you so much, David. I think this is actually a question that I would like to throw back at some point to our speakers, because as, um, I mean, this is exactly what we try to do as a network and in my role. We try to cater to the needs of our community. So we really believe in the work they do. And we really and we believe in the power of connecting these people uh, uh, to share the knowledge and help build on the existing knowledge, right? So there's a lot of knowledge that exists within each community uh, that could save time and save years of unnecessary replicated work that has happened in a different community. And one of the biggest issues that we face in this collective arena, let me speak of um, uh, this exact point, it's now that we're talking about how could communities and different organizations and different parts of the world that face similar issues can collaborate together to find collectively solutions that work for all um, uh, for their communities. Um, and this has been one of our questions, like, are there schemes, funding schemes that could help that kind of collaboration that can foster, for example, South-South collaboration so that uh, these organizations could come together and uh, work on certain projects? So, thankfully, we've actually worked to see that happen in few cases and we're very very uh, happy to have um, uh, facilitated funding for one of our recent projects which which is called the lab storm uh, uh, on climate change the lab storm project uh, was a collaboration that happened between two gig members in brazil and when we say brazil brazil is a huge country right and we were able to connect two of our gig members to work on a common uh, issue that they faced with the recent floods and all the uh, uh, climate catastrophe, catastrophes that happened uh, at the beginning of this year and last year. Uh, so we brought these two members who were able to conduct community workshops to learn from the community on the, the, the uh, dangers that they faced during uh, the catastrophe. And these communities came together, together from uh, Hasifi, the state of Hasifi and the state of Santos, uh, so that they can collectively work on finding solution, as I said, and they came out with five prototypes to be used in a case, uh, God forbids, of, of, of a renewed 
uh, catastrophe, right, of ha catastrophe happening. And this was enabled through a very, very small fund that we were able to obtain for our members, the North uh, South Bridges, for example. And um, uh, and this is one of the funders that we've dealt with, for example, in the past uh, years. And it's it has this nice scheme uh, that would allow the entire fund to go to our local actors. We only act as a vehicle, so we almost uh, don't get any money for this, but we are the German entity that is getting, I mean, we could also address this funding scheme at a, at a certain point, but that was one of the reasons why we established ourselves, for example, as a German entity um, uh, in Berlin, right? So that we're able to unlock this kind of funding for our members. So this is one of the things that we face as a network. We try to really capitalize on the power um, uh, that could come out of our members collaborating together and sharing their experiences uh, as to the projects and the problems that they face uh, on a daily basis. And how could we really capitalize on that shared pool of knowledge and replicate it in different places? So speaking of open sharing and replication, that also uh, is some of the keywords that have been used in our speakers' presentations today. So I can say that there's an, we're still exploring the fundraising scene in terms of this kind of uh, uh, work, and we'd hope to do more of that, right? Uh, and yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if that answers your questions. I'm happy to also elaborate more. It, it does. And there's one part that, you know, in our discussions that we've had in the past where you said that, that this compliance portion of being a physical host, how your networks actually tries to be that for, for the members. So can you just add, because that, that's one element. I think that's important whenever it comes to people applying to funds, especially smaller organizations that are just maybe received one or two fundings, but now wanting to scale up their projects. Yes. So as our network came to be at the very beginning, uh, there was a, a conversation, right, with um, uh, where should we found ourselves where should we we'd be grounded right we're our network uh, our our co-founders are based in berlin but we're a network of so many great organizations that are mostly uh, based in the global south uh, and this was a, a really insightful moment at the at the start of 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 this network because then we also kind of placed ourselves uh, we needed to place our, our presence in our establishment. And there came the idea that there's a lot of funding that is only open to European ent entities, right? Or this idea of a physical sponsor or this idea of some organization, smaller grassroots organization, not being able to access certain funding because uh, because of like due diligence and, and I don't know, all these fundraising funders uh, criteria that exist. And being us and very passionate about what we're doing, we just realized that this is actually, this would be one of our core uh, uh, missions, uh, one of them, it's not the main one, but we are always happy to act as a physical entity or uh, um, a legal entity when needed to any of our members who would like to unlock funds that are only available through a German or European entity. Uh, so this, this, yeah, this has been one of our roles so far. Mm. No, thank you so much. So let that. So now we got the perspective. You know how networks can support and enhance funding opportunities, and it's always best to get a perspective from civil society organizations. So let me go to our friends here, call deep. I want you to um, um kind of look at the two 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 aspects of it, successes that you've had as an organization when you guys are seeking funding as well as the challenges that you encountered, because I think that that's very important. And today we actually have, uh, you know, pretty big global representation from, from three different continents. So let, let me go to you and if you can answer that question, uh, it would be great. Are you with us? If not, let me go to you, Pamela. This is the same question, okay? Hello. Oh yeah. Did you hear my question? Or you want yes. Me to sorry, repeat? there there was a power cut, so I had to switch oh. to my phone. Uh, oh, my apologies. apologies. Um, no, with regards to your question, um, David, uh, you know, typically humanitarian responses are you know it's these are emergency funds, 
um, and what happens is that you know the the foremost import the foremost sort of uh, you know priority is the is the basic humanitarian support package, right? Um, what that then leads to is you know organizations develop like six months long projects um, and one year long project and do not have and have a very response driven lens and not a sustainability lens. Typically, these humanitarian crisis, especially the refugee crisis, even though everyone wants it to be temporary, very few of them really are temporary. And But the humanitarian actors cannot say that. Otherwise, you know, it, it goes against what they want, that they would want the refugees to settle back in their own country. So what happens is that like every organization that um, tries to focus on innovation really looks for innovation that are already proven and already Right. Um, um, you're kind of cutting up a bit. Let's give you a, a few minutes to see if you can come back. But I, I do agree with you. I, I think when it comes to the, the, the aid sector, and then I think we, we one of the things that Kudra Link exists is, is we play an advocacy role in terms of how aid is transferred. You know, we're one of the biggest uh, advocates when it comes to um, unrestricted funding, where we're, we give an opportunity for organizations to, to be innovative and to grow. And I think especially when it comes to the, the, like you said, the humanitarian sector, most everything, obviously you do have to address that. But like you said, if you look at, you know, refugee camps, they, 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 they end up started to be to last for um, six months up to a year, but in most cases they exist up to 20, 30 years in some cases, especially if, if you go to Uganda, some of the other settlements that have been created, they were to, supposed to be temporary shelters, but they're still functioning until, until this day. So I, I think you're having an internet issue. So we will we'll hold off to that question and Pamela, if we can go to you. And then, so same thing, you know, really to give us a uh, kind of a view of as, as, as an organization, the, the, the challenges that you've encountered in terms of being able to access funding, you know, specifically focused on philanthropy, you know, on foundations. But at the same time, which I think we always forget is the successes you've had as well, because I think that's the reason. And the more we share the successes we have, it would be easier for other art organizations to replicate those efforts. So let me pass the mic to you. Sure. Um, I think uh, it, it can be pretty challenging in general to be fundraising in this kind of social impact um, sector because there are a lot of organizations doing amazing work and, and not just amazing, but I think uh, doing really, um, really important work that is that is helping people's quality of life and even um, people's safety and well-being. So sometimes it seems like there's very limited funds to be distributed between a lot of organizations that are doing really, really important and even life-saving work. So, so it can definitely feel like a challenge, um, especially when we're um, trying to have ambitious, ambitious projects because there are very serious challenges that we are facing. However, um, sometimes when you're especially looking for grants, then they're they're very small grants, but they have high requirements or they um, they require like an uh, a very ambitious goal of of impact, but they're actually very limited. So I think that's one of the the challenges that many um, grassroots organizations face and many NGOs or social entrepreneurs. I think that's a very common goal, just to kind of access to funding for the type of work. Um, that that we're doing in kind of this intersection of innovation and but also the social impact part. Um, one one challenge is the uh, grant writing and and planning for a grant takes tends to take a lot of time and this time is usually not compensated if you don't get the grant in the end. So that's definitely a, a very um, a, it's a it's a challenge that can be very limiting to 
to the groups that are bootstrapped or self-funded um, or grassroots and are, and are just starting. And, you know, they cannot necessarily hire a grant writing or pay anyone to actually write the grants. Um, so if, if the grant is not received, then um, nobody is compensated for that work. So that can be also um, pretty challenging. And um, and I think these are these are things that are faced by by several organizations, several colleagues. You know that when when you talk in this space in the social entrepreneurship and the social impact sector, I think that's pretty common. Um, and then in terms of success stories, I I agree with Faria that collaboration is very powerful. So um, sometimes. Um, when when the groups get together um, and they share the load and also share the resources, that can actually be pretty powerful. And when we're talking specifically about grant writing, because that's one of the main uh, revenue streams that organizations have um, in climate change adaptation, then at least when that when that load is shared and when those resources are shared and, and elevated, then I think um, it's uh, higher higher chances of uh, getting competitive grants, um, but also it's less risk than trying to uh, tackle the grants on your own. So I think the collaboration is is actually very important. And then just building upon what um, what impact you have already made, I think that can also be be very very powerful and. And I think sometimes we think about um, about funding in the terms of, for example, the, the grants that you've received, but also there's a lot of wealth in the expertise that you have around you, the talent, the in-kind uh, um, the in-kind resources and contributions that, that you have, especially within the community groups. And so I think leveraging those and elevating those can also be very powerful in attracting more stakeholders and more collaborators that can support the cause. So those are those are some maybe some insights from my experience. No, no, I think you know one of the things is you know I do believe in the power of collaboration. Collaboration. One form of collaboration is sharing information. So actually, there's one of the things that we're doing is we've partnered with the unfunded list and we're actually finishing um, this phase, but we're actually reviewing the proposals are being reviewed by experts who've worked in foundations that are currently in foundations. So that is an offer that that will be rolling out in fall, which is going to be phase two, and we'll certainly reach out to gig and have that communication. And part of the eligibility criteria would be to, to, to sign up on Kuja Link, but that, that's most of the organizations are already doing that. So let me um, pass the, the mic to you, Pyro. So I think for you, there's kind of a unique element in, in terms of the, what you guys are doing. You're, you're, you're creating open source innovative way of actually producing a product so the kind of schematics that, that, that you're sharing so is, is it are you guys having a similar challenges with other what you call to be like traditional so society organizations or social enterprises or do you think for you that there is kind of a, a uniqueness mm, yes i think there is a uniqueness there mm, but i will take it to where pamela left it because we specifically phase this duality like being an open source collective that we develop technology on the one hand we have a lot of people individuals experts in the field who have contributed to the project because they believe in that and what we do and on the other hand it's quite difficult to attract funding because being open source it means that well let me take it from there like usually technology could be developed either from a company or an institution like a university so a startup, for example, can give something in return, either being future profits or being equity or something else. And the institution has different ways of being funded, like big programs and so on and on. But being a small crew that you develop technology, it's not easy to access either one of those. So that's, that's a difficult thing that we face. So we have a lot of people who can contribute, and that's amazing. But when it comes to funding, there, what we have seen that helps us is like you find foundations and organizations that you share the same ethics so they have to believe in the idea of technology has to be open they want to support open source hardware they want to see the empowerment of the local communities and not products being sold to them so you really need to reach this level that you understand each other very well and then funding can be achieved 
So that's one thing that we have faced specifically and it's close to developing this technology because it's one thing being in the field and you can prove that these things work. So we've been doing this for 10 years. And it's another thing when you're hidden in your basement or working with other maker spaces around the globe and still not proven that you can do is what you claim. So this is a, a tricky situation to be in. Mm. Another thing that has worked though in this situation is awards. Is like, if you think what you're doing is unique and innovative, well, you can also try to get some awards and this has worked for us. And so you can get some funding from there. So with the design awards or other kind of competitions, then you can also attract some funding to remain sustainable. That's, I mean, I think that that's one of the things that we've actually been posting recently as well too. That is a unique way because there's a lot of global competition when it comes to um, climate change and innovation. So that is one way. Like I said that obviously the, the, the competitions are pretty high, but I think if there is a good idea worth sharing, that is one kind of new source of funding opportunity. And thanks so much uh, for, for sharing with us. So Matthew, let me go to you. And it is the same question in terms of, you know, funding opportunity in terms of success, funding opportunity in terms of challenge. But I think when it comes to the, 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 the refugee context, most of the funding that, that, that comes is it's done through bilateral, either it's coming through UNHCR or like you said, um, much multilateral donor organizations, which compliance wise are much higher and much harder in terms of trying to, to fund access. So for you, if you, have you had success when it comes to these multilateral fundings or as an organization, do you guys usually focus on uh, the philanthropic funding space? Let me, let me pass the mic to you. Um, thank you so much. Um, in the case of the, the refugee camps, especially accessing funding is very, very difficult. Uh, one, in a way that um, most of the international organizations, they, uh, they have the lack of trust on, uh, uh, I mean, on grassroots organizations, which are, you know, uh, formed locally by refugees, uh, they have the thinking that uh, they they don't have the capacity to handle finances or you know uh, to 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 handle funds. So there's that lack of trust uh, from these organizations, and then some of the organizations they see or they look at uh, uh, refugee-led organization as competitors. Yeah, like they are competing with, with them. And that is something which is very hard. Uh, if I can say only a few organizations who managed to get uh, funding uh, from, let's say, UNHCR. Uh, for example, there is an organization called uh, Community Technology Empowerment Network, which I previously worked with. Um, so, they, they, they are the only organization that has been getting funding from, from UNHCRA in Rhino Palm uh, since 2017 until to date. But uh, getting uh, funds is really, really very difficult. And um, like uh, uh, Pamela has said, we tried like writing proposals and you know the time of writing this proposal, sometimes you write the proposals and uh, you then go through and the time for waiting for uh, for this uh, proposals outcome is really huge. But also you find out that the nature of the proposals that are being put, it requires quite a huge amount of time to, to write things. So, which also delays uh, implementation of other projects. So we have been uh, depending on our members' contributions, the members of CC4D, especially uh, us who volunteer to, to carry on, like we get uh, money by ourselves, like maybe we happen to work, to volunteer with other organizations and get the money in order to inject into CC4D's activities to see that activities run through. But also, uh, we've also been getting uh, support from uh, 
other international organizations like the Rock Agents, uh, the Global Innovation Gatherings uh, through their uh, programs. For example, uh, last year, uh, individual programs on mentorships programs where uh, we are given uh, uh, funds to implement projects. And uh, uh, after implementing projects, we ensure that also we run uh, we inject some of the money to run CC for these activities and as well they hope when they buy their tools and equipment uh, for doing the the activities. Yeah. So funding generally has been very difficult uh, in our context. And um we also uh do get funding through uh like uh, organizing the crowd fundings, especially for events. Uh, like the International Repair Day event last year that we hosted, we were able to, to run a crowdfunding. And even this year, we also have a running uh, funding, crowdfunding campaign, GoFundMe campaign. Uh, but the challenge has been that we could not meet our targets uh, of even the, the crowdfunding. Yeah. Because it needs a lot of resources, especially the marketing aspect. Uh, of the crowdfunding is something that needed also resources to be injected in. Yeah. And uh, for example, in the recent uh, campaign, we could get a lot of messages uh, for people who would wanted to uh, messaging us about how to uh, to market it further, our crowdfunding. But at the end, when they give uh, the ways at the end they needed funds even to run and and the and share the the crowdfunding to within their network, so which has been also something uh, very hard. So basically, in terms of funding, has really been uh, uh, very hard, and uh, the funds that we've been getting from the German government through uh, rogue agents was that they are mostly action based. Uh, kind of funds, yeah. So uh, you find that it's not consistently, like um, can be a uh, one week uh, kind of activity or two days kind of activities that we do, uh, yet there's huge that needs to be, uh, to be done. Mm, thank you. So basically mm, so those are some of the, the challenges in regards to the funding. Yeah. No, thank you so much, Matthew. So let me share just a few ways of you know where it comes to uh crowdfunding as as well as um there are different platforms out there that that do similar things in terms of you know the the, the size of the organizations that we have you have and that are available. But this is some just a few that that, that are, um sharing. But let me come to you, Sarah. Now, so I, I think when it comes to the uh climate space I and mean, the last three years since uh, climate 2025 has been around as well as you know your previous work as well too have you seen a major shift in, in, in terms of the funding landscape where uh, founders are trying to uh, fund smaller organizations or kind of um, enhance their ability to, to find more funding as well as if, if there are specific resources that you guys have uh, put together to help organizations kind of get to the next level in terms of being able to fund these innovative uh, climate uh, solution, climate adaptation projects. And then let me pass the mic. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think there has been a massive shift, which is, yeah, hearing myself say that is, is really strange because the shift has still been meager and sad in comparison to what it should be. And yet in three years, I've seen a massive shift um, in terms of the, the dialogue, not so much um, really the manifestations of where the funding is flowing yet. And I think maybe we'll see that in a, in a few more years. Um, so again, it's all relative. Um, but what I am seeing um, feels encouraging in many ways. Um, there are a lot um, 
of movements even within the philanthropic space. Um, I, there's a, a new term that's been coined, philanthro activism, essentially, where it's um, uh, the, the philanthropy space realizing that they have a major role to play in filling this climate finance gap and really um, taking some introspective approaches to understanding how they can do that. So of course the funding landscape is quite broad. And so I'm speaking about a very um, small grouping of funders who are exploring this space, but that is still a lot larger than it was previously. And I think they're having lots of influence. Um, and so as I was hearing all of you speak, um, all of these challenges are still existing, but then in my head, I'm thinking, oh, right. So they're looking for a track record. Um, but this group of funders over here, they're looking to seed projects. And so in my mind, I'm thinking about, okay, how do I elevate kind of those, um, those funders because they're out there. There's not enough of them, but they're out there. There are funders who are now exploring more models around trust-based giving and uh, focusing on learning as opposed to outcomes. And so that's becoming, um, you know, a, a bigger space that, that folks are, are looking to invest in. And then it's also a little bit, and I know this sounds kind of strange because these power dynamics are so problematic and they're met, meant to keep people in their place, so to speak. But I really think there's a lot to be said about stepping into your own power because a lot of funders don't know what they don't know. And, um, they're looking to be told they're they're just not kind of giving that that um that impression a lot of them are realizing they need to be giving at a certain level direct locally and don't know where to go and don't know how to do it and they need to be told um and there's actually i i have it in um there's a directory list, um, Debbie, I think you can share, but one of the things I just recently added was a framework that was just devised for how to keep funders accountable to grantees, um, that grantees are able to have standards and to ask things of funders and to negotiate. Um, and that I was also very uncomfortable with doing that myself. And it's only been through the practice in the last, really the last year and a half where it's been like, oh, there, there is room here. I just had to kind of step into it. Um, and that's not, you know, that's different for different people too. You have to acknowledge that. So this is not, we're not like all on the same footing here. Um, so um, I think, I, I know it's, it's really hard to kind of give everyone here this like, oh, here's all the opportunities or here's what the the landscape is, but as you're all speaking, in my mind, I was going, look at all these intersections that are going on here. You could be stepping outside of climate funding and also pursuing funding um, ar around groupings of health um, related funders or um, technology innovation or, um, you know, livelihoods. Um, and so there's a lot of intersections happening there, which broadens your base of funders, but also it helps you become more creative with the funders within the space because they are also looking at the intersections now. I think there's a lot more that are understanding the intersections and all of this sometimes is about wordplay. Um, it sometimes comes down to wordplay and framing. There's so much more I could say, so I'll stop there. <laughs> it's, it's, no, let me so the, let me just add two elements that I kind of want you to expand on because yeah. I think sometimes there's this internal kind of uh, jargons we used. You said trust-based philanthropy, you know. Yeah. So if if you can expand on that, Definitely. and I really want you to hit the point because. I think one of the things as a Deso as well as Kuja Link, one of our biggest fight that we're trying to do is for civil society organizations to understand there is a power dynamic that exists that the civil society organization holds power as well too. 
And then right. there is an event that's happening in Nairobi. Wings is trying to transform how philanthropy works, as well as shift the power that's coming in, in Colombia. So there's these movements and there's an understanding, I think, with the philanthropic world, like you said, there is a change that needs to be done. It, it is happening at a slower pace. But in order to move that, it's these kind of conversations that we're having. Because I think in most cases, everyone always wants to hear the, from the funder. But the voice mm. of civil society organizations are the most important voices. Because yeah. if those voices are not loud, then change is not coming. So let me, if you can expand on those, it would really be amazing. Yeah. Um, so just in terms of the trust-based philanthropy, that's been this whole movement of funders really going, wait a second, we're supposed to have, like a lot of them use excuses around, we need to, you know, auditing purposes or things like that around, we need to have um, verification of how the funds are spent and in which way because of certain legal and financial obligations we have. And some of that is true, but if you really go back and look at what criteria they need to hit, it's not really that extreme. And so I think a lot of funders are going, okay, so there's that aspect of it. And then there's also, we're just not best place to, to tell you where the funding is spent and how it's supposed to be spent and what you're supposed to get out of it. That's for the, the group to decide, the folks who are leading on the work to decide. And so there are a lot of different funds popping up that are really about providing that unrestricted funding. Now, albeit it depends on the, the level of funding and some of them are more you know, um, longer term grants recurring than others. So there's so many different models out there now, but it, it entails very little reporting or reporting in a way that is not about just having to sit down and write this grueling report around impact and data that is just difficult to keep up with and might not say much anyway. Um, it's about reporting in ways that are actually mutu mutually beneficial to everyone to really understand the change that's happening. Um, one uh, example of that, and this is just my own very meager lived experience of this, because again, I um, this is very recent for me to have this um, that direct experience going to funders and going, look, um, these activists are saying this, and we want to pool your money. We know we can address your um, reasons for not being able to do that financially and legally. We want to pool your money, and um, we want to have where that money goes and how it goes um, and how it's spent be decided by these activists. And we will work with them to to understand and learn how effective that can be and give you the learnings that we we all want those learnings it's not about no no people want to understand their impact but it's about on whose terms and how that happens in ways that allows people to get along with their work in flexible and, and faster ways um, and so that's what we're doing with one of these pilots is just how can we like practically get funding to individuals how can we practically do that in an unrestricted way that meets all the, you know, the obligations, reporting obligations that we have with the least burden on the folks who are receiving that funding? And how can we all learn together in ways that build community that um, are able to uh, build on the collective wisdom of everyone in that group and then you know, inform a better funding model. And that's what a lot of people are doing is how can we inform better funding models? Um, and yeah, just to speak to one of your points, a couple of you brought up around competition. Uh, that's another big issue where you are um, basically feeling like you have to compete with folks for money. There's not enough to go around. And um, really focusing on that collaborative aspect, whether it's just, you know, also for the grant writing component, but also funders like to know that you know where you are in the ecosystem and how you complement others and how you're mutually reinforcing each other's work. And so that collaborative aspect really actually helps you, even if it's not a partnership you can handle right away because you don't have the capacity, being able to name it and name that you understand kind of how your work is reinforcing another, another's work actually makes them think, oh yeah, my funds are multiplying because I'm actually also helping this group out and this group out. Um, so it's really, some of these are just 
um, little reframings. Um, I mean, the whole system needs to be like uprooted, but in the meantime, these are some little reframings to think about in terms of just really being a, a bit more, um, making the space a bit more approachable and, and maybe um, conceivable for getting that funding. I don't know. Well put, Sarah. I mean, I think for me, like the reason we always do these webinars is for two practical reasons. One, the pragmatic approach of how to address today's issues. But at the same time, we should always keep in mind that there's this system transformation, system change that we're fighting for. Because for the last 60 years, if you look at how the... Um, um, you know, the, the humanitarian as well as development, which for me now climate falls under that category as well, too, is, is these funding mechanisms that are set up at the multilateral as well as the philanthropic space have really not allowed for innovation to be forward. And, and I think, in my opinion, there's always a statistic that I use is that if you look at the cosmetic industry in the U.S., they spend about $3 billion just in the U.S., a year only for research and development. That's not adding marketing and other things. And in 2019, one of the largest foundations spent only $12 billion to address the uh, world issue. That includes every sector that you can include in. So it, it's one of those where in order to solve a trillion dollar problem, you can't put a few billion dollars you actually truly have to spend and I think these voices that are here and that's for me the way I always like it is the conversation is between networks which I think are extremely important because they amplify the voices in the different sectors and the civil societies that are actually doing the fight and that's an important voice to listen to. So it's not just one voice. And out of these conversations, hopefully we can co-create the solution that, that we want to happen. And at the same time, find some kind of current pragmatics and solutions that we're going. So let me, I don't know if your internet is uh, up and running called deep, but I want to give you a full opportunity to kind of explain, you know, some of the challenges and successes that you have. And I think when it comes to, like you said, this um, emergency and disaster areas, it's a very important conversation to have because they're always supposed to be temporary, but, but they last many, many years. So if you let me um, pass the mic to you. I think he might have just fell. The, oh, yeah. he's still having some internet issues, right? Okay, okay. So we have um have concluded about an hour and a half, which I think is impressive. You know, and the time has gone fast. So there's two ways that we can go about it. So in some cases, when you open up questions, there are no questions. So if that's the road, then uh, there's another format that I'll follow where there's a few questions that I think we can kind of go around and answer, but I do want to give an opportunity to our participants both ways. I mean, we're here to co-learn and co-share, so some of the questions that I've asked, if you guys have any suggestions and challenges and successes that you have, please it will raise your hand. And I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and unmute too so you can share with us. So let me open the floor to, to our participants. If you're having an issue unmuting, like you can just type in the chat or raise hands and I, I can go ahead and do that. But if there is not any question like, oh, Okay, sorry. There is okay. Go ahead, Teresa. Hi, folks. Um, it's been great to hear all of these um fantastic stories of the work you all are doing in your in your communities. I'm a huge fan of of gig, um, and all its members. So my name is Teresa Crawford, and I work with um Dawit at Kuja Link. And I'm curious if anyone can give a good example of a, of a funder that they're working with or a funder that they've developed a partnership with over, you know, over time that is a particularly up uplifting or positive example of where someone has made an investment, um, you know, in the work you all are doing. And it could be any funder. 
corporate funder, a, a local funder, uh, an international one, one from the U.S. I, I don't really care, um, but I just would be curious sort of what are some of the aspects of that relationship that have been particularly positive. Um, and if Sarah, if you have any as well from your all work, you said you're sort of being a little more optimistic because you are seeing some change and improvement. If there's one or two that you might want to call out to say, you know, hey, this is this is the type of funder practice we're we're looking for. Okay, so let me so let me give an opportunity. So we will kind of go by the, the name. So Fadia, yeah, you go first. You know, then Pamela, then Sarah. I think the way it's set up, uh, and, and Pyros, then Matthew, and I think Caldeep still have an issue. So let me unmute and you guys. Uh, Go ahead and there's another question, Anthony. We will come to you, okay? I, I'm more really curious to hear more of uh, our civil organization, but I'm going to talk about this recent uh, relationship that we've had with the North-South Bridges and German Nordzutbrook, and this is uh, one of the funders that we've been working closely with in different funding scheme, and as I said... Can you one, put one, it in the chat? Sorry for interrupting you, Fadia, so that way I can put it in the resource, like the... the yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. Is it my turn to speak? I'm kind of confused. <laughs> yes, you are. You <laughs> are. No, you're the okay. first to go. Sorry for interrupting. No, it's okay. Yes, I will. I will put it. And it's been really eye opening because it's one of um, um, so this is part of my work is working closer with our members, the local organizations that are able to access this very minimal. We're talking about 10,000 to 25,000 euros, you know, that are implementable on a period of six month or something like this but it's still it's been great like we've had many members um showing interest and we've had many projects being accepted in the past uh, and some of the feedbacks that we've got from our members for example uh was we would like to have a second iteration of the project so a lot of the projects that we funded were like pilot projects you know, some some things that people would like to test or some kind of let's start this collaboration and see where it could lead. And then as soon as it goes somewhere, this is when the funding period ends and, and the project has to be put in another drawer. So this is one of one of the things that uh, we've been facing. Of course, there's this whole like even though it's a it's a it's a great funder on so many level, but we're still having to work with this, for example, the language element you know they're a German funder that still expects the project to be written in German and reports in German so we play a lot of big role in translating in the middle between the local organization or the civil society organization and um so you know and the funder uh, themselves so it is still you know we're still working in this area right and even though we're able to communicate that feedback to them but they have to work with a bigger bureaucracy of you know, the ministry where they're funded and, you know, it, it just feels always like there's a lot of hurdles and so many things that might come so basic, you know, and so simple that you have to navigate the whole time. So this, 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 from my experience, it's, it's a great collaboration between this funder, but it's still, it, it's, it's taxing in terms of time and, and energy and, and all of that. There's one aspect. Another aspect is in these scenarios, for example, our work is not, uh, funded, right? So our working time is not funded in this case. We have to do all this communication between the local organization and the German funder, but we do that throughout, you know, by hacking, you know, our time differently somehow to 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 phrase it uh, in a correct manner. And um, and and it's still very hard to kind of place, for example, the kind of work we do in general uh, in the funding world. So. As I said, I think this whole world of knowledge and collaboration and open knowledge exchanges that are happening that are being utilized now with the presence of the internet and the technologies and and the and the and the starting of these digital communities, as I would call it, this is a very uh, uh, new area, but it's also very effective, very new, and it's going on and it's coming in very strong. However, it's still very hard to place in all the funding schemes, right? So it's not, we don't only do climate change, for example. We don't only do uh, uh, youth learning. We don't only do, so it's, it's like we need to box the kind of work where we see a lot of value in. We try to fit ourselves into small boxes so we're able to fund our working time so we can do the great stuff that we're doing. So I don't know if that answers your question, but it's just like, again, it's about boxing ourselves 
within the funding schemes instead of having an open conversations like the one we're having today where we say, hey, look at how cool and how great what we're doing. We can, we want to talk, as Sarah said, we want to show impact. We want to talk about impact, but everyone would uh, uh, express that impact differently, right? We would we would show impact differently. And, 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 and that kind of conversation is the thing that I feel we're lacking in our small ecosystem. Uh, and this is why I'm so, so happy and so grateful to have this uh, conversation. And, and this is why also why I really appreciate the kind of work that Kujalink uh, does uh, at, at that moment. And yeah, so thank you so much for it. And uh, I hope this- yeah, Thank you so much. You know, that, that was- that was a very, really great answer. So let me go to you, Pamela, same thing, then Sarah, okay? Um, yeah, I can say something, especially about the project that I'm working with, um, with the sargassum mitigation in the Caribbean. And this fund, this project is funded by National Geographic Society. And um, I can say that something that has been very helpful from National Geographic is that um, I think they understand that projects changes, projects change um, as uh, as they go on. So um, especially when we're talking about working with com with local communities and also working in the innovation space. So you cannot predict everything in the moment that you're writing the proposal and you might need to make some changes to your activities, methodologies, to your impact, to your budget. Um, to results. So I think that's something that has been very helpful from National Geographic is that I think they do understand that. And so they um, uh, they are pretty flexible when it comes to um, making some changes and communicate, communicating changes from the original proposal um, to the, the actual project. And that's something that I know it's not, um, it, it's not in place in, in every grant. So there are some grants um, or or just funding schemes that are very strict about, about um, performing exactly what was done in the proposal, um, the activities and, and the budgets. And so there it's pretty hard to make changes afterwards. And so something that we really appreciate from NetGeo is just that understanding that we're going to learn as we go and then there might be some changes as we go. Um, so that's maybe just something that I would uh, share that I think it's very helpful for our team. Thank you so much. I don't know. Let, let me go to you, Sarah. Yeah, I think there have been um, a couple, one of them just being one of Climate 2025's own funders. Um, so they're the Montpellier Foundation. And, um, uh, you know, they they funded a lot of our core work and um, and they were one of our largest funders. And so it felt like there was a lot of pressure, uh, at least what I was kind of generating in my own head <laughs> of what I needed to be producing for them when I walked into these meetings and how I needed to be holding myself and, and holding this space. Um, and when things weren't going the way that we planned, you know, there was one point at which I just resolved to go in and go, look, it's not this anymore, it's that, and here's why. And um, it was a really energizing conversation. And I felt like the person um, on the other end of the call also felt a sense of like connection and trust and, and higher confidence in us for being able to name those things and say those things and bring it to the table and go, we're, we're really serious about trying to work through this issue. Um, and so that for me was um, kind of one of my own transformative moments for how I interact with this space and how I just bring authenticity to it. And that's easy to say and not easy to do. So yeah, I, I get almost how that sounds because if I heard that three years ago, I'd be like, what are you talking about? Um, so it it is um, something that comes with like the experiential aspect of it, that practice, but really again, stepping into that power because I think that um, a lot of it is based on that trust. And um, I'll also speak to another group that I'm working with. They are not themselves a funder, but they are a network of funders. Um, they're called the Environmental Funders Network. And um, I met with one of their community managers of, about a year and a half ago. And 
we were just sharing frustrations about um, getting funding into the, the movement space. And being, again, really open and honest with each other about our own vulnerabilities working in this space and, and how we felt about what power we had or didn't have, power we needed to name and things we needed to do and, and kind of understanding those different levers. Um, building that connection with that network um, and then really being able to understand, okay, they themselves are not funders, but they are influential with a bunch of funders and they can help guide conversations. They can help um, create new opportunities um, and, and, and we can bring visibility to lots of groups that we're working with. Um, and so just understanding, um, Fidia was talking about networks and um, the power that comes with that, it's so organic. You almost don't, you, you can't plan it, but you have to keep working at it every day because um, those are the types of things that just create those, um, those open up those opportunities for funding. So it is very relational, um, but it, yeah, it's very, it's very network based. And you do have your funders still who are still back in, you know, their armchairs and they want certain types of, um, outputs and they want you to speak a certain way and sometimes I might have confounded them or made them go huh that wasn't what I was expecting but I don't think I disappointed them either and I they wouldn't have been ready to give us funding anyway so I just kind of treat that as um, a, a conversation a networking conversation that still yields opportunity in the future. Thank you so much, Sarah. Let me go to you, uh, Pyros, if you have, you know, even in these competitions, there's always these interactions that you have. So as Theresa's question go, if there's specific ones that you want to highlight, so and put it in the chat so we can put it in the resource that we'll be sharing afterwards. Yeah, thanks. I will be happy to share two stories. Mm -hmm. The one has to do with this Helidoni Foundation. We received some funding from there, and it has to do exactly with this trust that Sarah was saying. So we really have to reach this level that we have to meet the, the founder of it and make him trust us in a personal level to, to have access to the funding. And if you've ever been to fundraising, you know how impossible that is to have access to this kind of people. Typically, you just uh, send this like an application, nobody sees anyone, this is so impersonal. So this was a process that took months, like discussing, meeting each other. And it, it was also interesting that this was a local foundation. So we also had luck on our side. For example, one of our members would meet him cycling on the streets and he was also cycling. So seeing that, well, we actually share the same values in the same way of living and cycling together and discussing. So you can build this trust, you know, okay, these guys are just not here for my money. They actually live this way. So I can believe in them. So that was an interesting story for us to see that it might be very difficult, for example, to attract the funding if it's so impersonal and you're so small from the States, for example. But if you try something local that you can have a face-to-face -face conversation or you can participate in an airport, like the Global Innovation Gathering, that you meet people, that you get to see people face-to-face -face and then interact, then that's totally different. And then the second one I can share, which is also interesting, is the hardware prototype fund. This goes very specific, for example. You have to go niche of the niche. So this is like exactly what we're doing. So they were funding open hardware development. It's like, okay, this is what we need. These are big guys. But again, it takes a lot of effort to find it and see, okay, these are so specific and so close to us that we cannot miss it. <laughs> it's like, you're made for us. But we got it, for example. And but you need to spend a lot of time waiting for the application time to come, and communicating, networking, patience, and so on for this kind of opportunities to come. And but then looking for the exact partners that share the same passion about you might give you much higher chances of receiving the funding than go to more generalist ones. So these are maybe two stories that I can see. No, no, that's actually, I think, you know, one of these discussions for me, these webinars that I like is there's always this bit of information that you have gone through. And then that of that experience, you're teaching someone else that, that they're kind of the required skill. Most of it is a soft skill that you can't put down. I mean, thanks for sharing that. I'm not seeing Matthew 
on here unless did he drop off? We might have had some internet. I think Matthew's under the name gig member now, right? Is that you, Matthew? Let me give you co-hosting right if that is um I think okay. Can, can, can you hear us? Yes, yes, I can I can hear. Sorry, I I, I ran out of internet a bit, so I had to change from one device to another. Sorry, it happens. <laughs> so, yeah, so did do you want me to, to repeat the question um Teresa asked or did, did you did you get an opportunity to hear it? No, I, I actually didn't get the opportunity to hear. Maybe Okay. Could... Yeah, let me just yeah, let me repeat this. So basically the question she asked is can you name organization funding organization that you've had positive interaction with and that that's giving you funding and put it in the chat so we can put it in the resource if you have some stories that kind of have a soft element that you want to share with us as well too. Uh, well uh the we, we basically have uh we received funding uh one is from the individual funds from geek uh, for our during our mentorship programs, and uh, we for the organization uh, that is direct to the organization, uh, we only received uh, funding from uh, uh, Rock Agents, yeah, who is currently our uh, direct funder. But uh, uh, apart from that, we still don't have uh, other funders, but. Uh, they are those individual persons that who that has been supporting us. Okay, thank you so much, Matthew. So, Anthony, I, I know you've raised your hands, and so let me go. You uh, go ahead and ask your question. Mike is yours. Thank you so much, David, for this opportunity. Uh, I'm from Zambia, and. Uh, I founded an organization called Greenit Environmental Management Network. Are you getting me? Yes, we, we can hear you, Anthony, clear and loud. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So I founded an organization called Greenit Environmental Management Network. I started the, this organization in 2021 during the period when COVID, there was a lockdown during the period of COVID. Uh, and 2022, we got to register it. Registration after registration, we we now had to go full throttle into into rolling out our activities. But then the issue has been about funding. The only the only funding that we got was the mega amount just from one businessman locally. And then from then on, it has been a struggle. So some of the friends that I started with even dropped out of it. Uh, but I've, I've still hung on with a few friends. And it's really been a struggle to the extent that sometimes I get emotional looking at how our environment is being harmed by, you know, every person. And I'm in a rural setup where uh, you know, there are these challenges to do with fuel. So people depend on really cutting trees for them to just access energy and all that. And so we want to change the mindset of these people, but then resources I, I challenge. And so in my research, I got to get to Kujaling and having a, a, a platform like this, it's really something that is eye-opening and I hope that uh, we could we could uh, engage each other further. Kujaling, you're doing a good job, and also you participate uh, presenters. I'm really I've really learned a lot, and even the links that you have shared, I did, I hope that going forward I can get to have some of the funding that we need to roll out our programs and our activities. I thank you. No, thank you so much uh, for sharing that, Anthony. I mean, I think one of the goals that we have here is, like I said, we have our partnership with GIG, 
and as well as some of the things that, that we offer, it's by collaboration, by moving forward together, we'll be able, one, to understand how this funding landscape works, and two, the thing that I said uh, and is that we're going to push it to change and to be more favorable to uh, Global South organizations. We've actually done amazingly with time. We have about um, six minutes left to go. I can ask a question, but I mean, let me let me give an opportunity for people to say goodbye and any information you want to add. Uh, let me start with you, Sarah. Be conscious of time. Just one minute. You know anything? If you don't have, you can skip as well too. So. Yeah, I think it might just be good to say thank you. This was a really energizing conversation, um, and I'm happy to follow up with some some links. You know, as I was just listening, I was thinking about some 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 different things to share so um I'd, I'd love to follow up with them and, and also love to keep in touch with folks and, and thanks for making this space this was really great thank you so much Sarah. pamela the same thing goes to you thank you so much thank you everyone um and it was really nice to hear about everyone's um, project and perspectives and experiences um with funding so thank you and also thank you um for organizing the webinar it was our pleasure. And Fadia, let me give you the, the same opportunity. Uh, yes, again, I I thank everyone for being here. And I, I just want to end saying um, how important these conversations are uh, during this time specifically. We, you, I mean, everyone was talking today about the change of systems, right? Uh, there is a certain power systems or hierarchies that need to change. And it's, it's in a place, even if it's not... Um, happening so quick as we'd hope it to, to happen but it's happening and i feel it happens exactly because of these conversations and because of the collective uh, um, consensus around the importance of these conversations so that people join forces and join uh, uh, ideas on how we could uh, together um, be able to reach a better place in terms of finding funds and do the work, the great work that we do. So I really would like to thank everyone for, for being here today. And, and thank you so much, uh, David, for offering to send um, a follow-up with all the resources that were shared today, because I think this is also very important. And for the speakers, I think also David uh, said at some point that he would be getting in touch uh, with you guys individually regarding uh, possibilities of, of you joining Kujalenga, the platform, and, and seeing how Kujalenga could help also uh, you find the right kind of funds for the amazing projects that you've shared with us today. So, yeah, that's it. No, exactly. Thank you for, for mentioning that. So, uh, Iris, let me go to you. I think it was great, like very inspiring listening to all these projects and the people sharing their personal stories about it. So, thank you so much for giving us this opportunity. And I think it's also very empowering. I mean, there is a, a dozen of new links there that we can browse through and find what might be interesting for us. So that's the power of the network. Like I could have, it would have taken me ages to get all this together. So thank you for organizing this. And David, thank you so much for helping us run this smoothly. And Fadia for having invited us here. And Sarah for sharing her expertise openly. So thank you all so much. My pleasure. Same goes to you, Matthew. Well, um, I'm so grateful uh, and happy to have been, uh, you know, joined uh, this network. Uh, I mean, also this uh, session, it's, it's really so insightful and with a lot of learning and also networking, which is so grateful. And I'm so happy that, you know, such platforms are the one that has, you know, uh, made us, and CC4D very visible, especially to the uh, to the world, and uh, we are so thankful for this. And uh, it's it's really so great and a good opportunity for us as uh, CC4D, you know, being in such a uh, network of people uh, uh, who share resources and knowledge, you know, openly. And it's so grateful. It's a lot of learning, and it's so grateful. And looking forward, you know, to uh, 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 having more, I mean, attending more kind of such events and also networking with, uh, with donors or with funders from uh, the Global South. 
Thank you so much. I'm really so grateful. And thank you so much, Matthew. So I have put my um, email address, and this should be the last one, and a, a link to, to, to our website as well. And one of the things is, you know, we've just made friendships, and we definitely want to continue this friendship. Please reach out to me so we can kind of have a much more in-depth conversation moving forward. And to those who've been friends, and I, I'm definitely enjoyed this, and I really want to thank the speakers for coming, you know, for Time is the most precious thing for me and in everything that you have. So the fact that you gave time to, to be here is really amazing. And I really want to thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart. And we have one minute. I think we've done really well with time today. So, And I wish you all, uh, you know, depending on your time zone, a good morning, a good afternoon, and good evening until we, we see each other next time. Uh, enjoy. Bye.